the uh, So tonight we have a discussion about basically uh, habitat, bird habitat. Uh, the, the topic is the Jackson Demonstration State Forest. And our speaker is Dr. J.P. O'Brien. He's gonna give us a history of the forest and talk a little about the different styles of management and how they've affected the forest that we have now and talk a little about what the future may hold for it. Uh, and how that affects certain birds. Dr. O'Brien is a Northern California native, comes from Trinity County, even further north than us, currently a resident of the Mendocino Coast. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in Applied Physics and a Certificate in Applied Spatial Statistics. Uh, and uh, his doctorate was in Climate and Atmospheric Science. He is currently a climate scientist affiliated with the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado and the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory in Berkeley, California, and has been studying and understanding climate change and variability in a world with a lot of uh, change and variability going on right now. So with that, I will welcome tonight's guest and turn it over to him. Dr. O'Brien, thank you very much for speaking with us. Great, yeah, thank you for having me. Can you guys hear me okay? I can, yes. Great. And um, and can is my screen full screen now? Uh, I can see that. There you go. Yeah. The one other thing I wanted to mention before you get started is uh, the format. Uh, it works best by Zoom if we try not to interrupt the speaker with questions as he's going along. But the chat function makes it very easy to write down your questions. And then uh, if there's a break in the presentation, uh, we can get to it. Otherwise, we will have a Q&A question and answer session with Dr. O'Brien at the end of his presentation. So stick around for that and make free use of the chat function if you can. Thanks. Yeah, that's that's great. Uh, my presentation will almost certainly go a little bit long. There's a, a lot to talk about, um, but I'm more than happy to stick around and answer as many questions as I can as, you know, as long as the hosts are willing to stick around. Um, so broadly, this is a talk about Jackson Demonstration State Forest. Um, I know there's uh, a lot of questions about it, and uh, I'm going to try to be extremely comprehensive here and answer uh, as many questions and give as much of a in-depth uh, view of the history of this forest. And uh, because I'm a climate scientist, and this is maybe a little bit out of the scope of the talk, I tend to think about large time and space scales. That's just the way my brain works. Um, so I am going to uh, start this talk. Um, uh, at about 5 million years ago, um, because why not? Um, so uh, 5 million years ago, uh, we have the uh, time axis down here. Uh, uh, atmospheric CO2 levels were about the same as they are today. Uh, the planet was much warmer. Um, and uh, and so what the kind of climate we're moving into now is uh, is something that essentially we have never seen before. Um, so the last time CO2 levels were uh, as high as they are now was at least 2 million years ago, owing to uh, the uncertainty in some of these uh, paleo records. Um, but almost certainly uh, it's been a uh, millions of years since uh, that time uh, that we've had CO2 levels this high. Uh, what did North America look like then? Uh, this is a re uh, uh, geologic reconstruction. These maps are made by the University of Northern Arizona uh, by a paleogeographer, uh, Robert Blakey. Um, and this is a reconstruction of what North America looked like 5 million years ago. Uh, you can see that the uh, Bering Land Bridge was intact at that time. Uh, Greenland was still attached to North America. Um, and at that time, uh, the California coast had not developed the way we know it now. Um, the San Andreas Fault was flooded and the Mendocino Coast was still underwater. Um, and so just to, uh, just to kind of keep in perspective of human evolution as well, uh, where were humans around this time? Uh, so if we look at um, kind of deep history, right, the first uh, pre-human was an Australopithecus uh, lucy, which was the first biped uh, at around 3.2 million years ago. Uh, at around 2 million years ago, we had Homo habilis show up. These were the first people to use stone tools. 
Uh, at around 1.5 million years ago, we have Homo erectus were the first people to resemble modern humans. Um, and it wasn't until 400,000 years ago that Homo sapiens, the first humans, uh, arrived on the scene. Um, and then later on, uh, or 100,000 years ago, uh, it was the last evidence of uh, Homo erectus, and uh, 40,000 years ago was the last evidence of Neanderthals in Europe. And so uh, it was this last 20,000 years, really, where things get interesting for North America. Um, the first humans uh, reach the Americas around 25 to 20 or 12,000 years ago. And uh, what North America looked like then, this is another reconstruction from 12 to 15,000 years ago. You can see the ice sheet uh, is almost at its maximum. The glacial maximum was around 20,000 years ago. The furthest southernward extent of the glaciers was around southern uh, 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 Illinois. Um, and so, um, so, and possibly uh, this, there was an area that was open uh, in the Laurentian ice sheet right about here, but the land bridge is still intact at this time. Um, it was around 10,000 years ago that the first farming occurred. Um, and then 10,000 years ago, uh, the ice sheet, this was at the kind of the peak of the interglacial, the ice sheet had opened up um, through what is now uh, Alberta and Northern British Columbia and uh, Northern Alaska. Um, at around 5,000 years ago, the first metal tools were showing up in Europe, and this is about as old as the oldest living tree. Um, and so the timing effect of, uh, arrive, uh, of human arrival in North America, there's uh, a lot of, uh, I guess, uncertainty about this, but I thought this was a really cool paper that I came across kind of while thinking about uh, these kind of timescales and, and humans in North America that uh, they use this really cool statistical Bayesian technique. And ultimately what they find is that the most likely time for humans in North America is around 15,000 years ago. Um, and so at around that time, either uh, the migration pathways were through that uh, split in the Laurentide ice sheet or possibly before, uh, because there was is some evidence that people perhaps showed up as early as 25,000 years ago and maybe even earlier. Um, and these were almost certainly coastal migration routes because it would have been nearly impossible to traverse uh, a giant ice sheet where there was no really animals living and you couldn't hunt or gather food. Um, and so uh, with regard to our local area, um, in 2006, archaeologist John Parker found what is uh, appears to be a Napa obsidian scraper, and this is obsidian from Napa that was actually found in Clear Lake, and this was dated to be 20,000 years ago. So it is possible that uh, there were people inhabiting uh, Lake and uh, Mendocino County as early as 20,000 years ago. Uh, but this is only one artifact. There's quite literally only one sample uh, that is that is that old. So uh, who knows? However, by uh, 12,000 years ago, uh, there is ample evidence for uh, for uh, what the archaeology literature calls uh, Paleo Indians, and these are generally known to be Clovis peoples. Um, and uh, and there's really a, a lot of artifacts that um, suggest that um, there was a, a thriving culture uh, in Lake County uh, and probably uh, beyond as well uh, as early as 12,000 years ago. Um, by 3,500 years ago, um, uh, the archaeological evidence is, you know, the uh, points are really refined. There's nice stone tools. Um, and at about this time, the climate is becoming similar to what we're experiencing today, right? Um, so the peak of the interglacial was about 10,000 years ago. And uh, during that time, uh, different uh, plant species were inhabiting, uh, beginning to inhabit this area. Uh, so reconstructed population based on inhabited areas uh, suggests that population was very, very low through the first 5,000 years, but then dramatically increased after about 5,000 years. And this is tied to uh, acorn processing. So uh, beyond earlier than 10,000 years ago, uh, there were no really oaks around here. Oaks uh, in the pollen record um, just showed up because they typically like warmer weather um, and hotter climates. Uh, they were not present during the glacial maximum and they just showed up around 10,000 years ago. And so it took about 5,000 years for the oaks to really get established and for uh, the early Native Americans to uh, understand that they were a really valuable food source. 
Um, there is a, a pretty dramatic drop in population indicated by the inhabited area, um, either due to a volcanic eruption uh, at Clear Lake uh, or climate change. Um, either way, uh, this is tied to about when uh, people started dispersing away from Clear Lake and the different uh, cultures started to take on their own uh, flavors. And this is actually uh, indicated by um, uh, linguistic studies of, of native languages. So it's about uh, 3,500 years ago that uh, these different uh, Homo peoples uh, actually uh, developed their own identities in their own regions um, uh, where they lived. And so around a thousand years ago, um, you've got really nice stone tools uh, and, you know, the, uh, the people were living uh, in these uh, really uh, stable villages and, and even the south southeastern Pomo uh, were practicing private land ownership with families owning, uh, you know, one or more tracts of land, which I think is, is pretty cool and interesting. And then it's about this time that the first evidence of people inhabiting uh, Jackson show up. Uh, and these are uh, from Three Chop Village. Uh, at around a thousand years ago, uh, there's evidence of a pre-Pomo people. And if you read this paper, it uh, appears that these pre-Pomo people were actually Yuki people. Uh, and then in uh, a little bit later, around 650 years ago, uh, Northern Pomo people moved in and started inhabiting the site. And then later between uh, in the 1800s, the Mituan band of Pomo people were inhabiting the site in the 1850s and up to 1856. And kind of it was this later time that kind of gave us the uh, the classic distinguished uh, uh, different uh, tribes of uh, Pomo peoples and Yuki peoples uh, of the area. And so 1949 marks the kind of the beginning of the gold rush and this dramatic influx of white Americans to California. And at that time, the population of indigenous Californians is estimated to be about 175 to 200,000 people. Uh, and note, this is about one person per square mile. Uh, the current population density of California is 250 people per square mile. And it is estimated that there was about 20,000 indigenous peoples in Mendocino County. Uh, in 1850, the frolic capsizes off Point Cabrillo and the survivors uh, of that wreck who made it to the shore kind of marked the first Americans to set foot uh, on the Mendocino coast. Uh, later attempts by non-natives uh, to recover the cargo resulted in the discovery of the Great Redwood Forests here. And it's actually interesting that some of the Pomo peoples that were living in Three Chop Village actually recovered some of these artifacts because uh, there was remnants of Chinese pottery found in Three Chop Village. Uh, the Frolic was a Chinese uh, a trade ship uh, brought bringing goods to San Francisco that, uh, that wrecked off the coast. So in 1855, uh, redwood logging kind of has begun further south in the Garcia Albion areas and uh, was moving up uh, north uh, on the coast and further inland. Um, and the Big River area was logged around 1858. Uh, the Russian and Upper uh, Eel River valleys are becoming increasingly populated with uh, white non-native homesteaders and ranchers. Um, and the Pomo and Yuki people suddenly find themselves kind of in between a rock and a hard spot, right? Loggers to the west and settlers to the east. Uh, in 1856, uh, wealthy and influential non-native settlers such as Seronius Hastings uh, wrote to the California governor legislature uh, requesting funding for armed militias for the extermination of native peoples who were becoming, you know, increasingly problematic. And Seronius Hastings is the person who uh, UC Hastings, the law school in San Rafael was named after, which they actually just recently changed their name uh, due to this uh, incident. Um, so it was between 1856 and 1860 that a state-sponsored genocide campaign ensued. Um, and this is really well documented in the literature uh, in various theses, uh, genocide in the California, Indians of California, um, the destruction of the Indian in Mendocino County uh, by Gary Garrett, um, and books as well, uh, An American Genocide, uh, the California Indian Catastrophe, um, and then later California Native American Genocide Murder State. So this is this was a really well-documented phenomenon that I was actually, I didn't know much about uh, until I kind of started reading and uh, learning about this issue. So between 1849 and 1865, this 16-year period, about 150 native people, 150,000 native peoples in California had been murdered, including 16,000 in Mendocino County. 
Um, of the approximately 8,000 Yuki people that lived here in 1849, in 1943, there were only 10 full-blooded Yuki known to be alive. And so ultimately, like, this is why we are currently on uh, unceded native lands, because not only were these lands taken, uh, but they were taken in the most heinous and brutal way possible. And so it's always good to think about and remember this. So uh, in 1860, uh, Siegfried Casper settled at the mouth of the namesake creek and in 1861 built the first sawmill in the area. In 1864, Jacob Green Jackson purchased the mill and founded the Casper Lumber Company, which was later incorporated in 1880. Uh, logging of the giant redwood trees began with big oxen teams that skidded the felled trees uh, down to the mills. Uh, but in 1890, uh, yarding and skidding transitioned into steam donkeys, uh, which were either powered by coal or wood, um, and used steam engines to generate the uh, tremendous force that it takes to move a redwood tree. Um, and then from 1869 to 1924, an extensive rail system had been built uh, for the transport of these massive trees. And this is here in uh, Casper. I love these old pictures. They're uh, so cool. Um, so then by uh, uh, logging by Casper continued in the west end of the forest and expanded eastward until 1947. So by the late 40s, most of the large uh, 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 easy timber um, on the west end of the forest had been felled and, you know, for various other reasons, uh, Casper Lumber Company had reached its end. Um, Casper Lumber then offered to sell its holdings to the state of California. This is the cover page of the original 1947 sale document between Casper Lumber Company, the vendor, and the state of California, Department of Natural Resources, Division of Forestry, Vendee. Uh, the state purchases Jackson for $1.5 million. Uh, in 2022, this is uh, $20 million and equates to an average cost of around $400 per acre, which is pretty amazing. It, it was an uh, incredibly good deal. Um, uh, I think, you know, now you can't get land for less than $1,000 per acre. Um, and so this is the original map uh, that was given that came along with the sale documents. This is what the state of California was buying in 1947. This map here is dated uh, 1946. Um, and so you've got the different land designations uh, for these different uh, areas of land. So uh, there were 258 million board feet of large virgin timber situated on over 10,000 acres of land. Uh, this is the area CJ in the east end of the forest, and then the area PL uh, in the west end of the forest. So these totaled over 10,000 acres of large virgin timber. Uh, in, in addition, they also got uh, 40 cabins, 33 family houses, one cookhouse, store building, a service station, a bunch of other stuff. It's uh, really interesting to actually read through this. Um, and then uh, they also, on these lands, were... 90 million board feet of small virgin timber situated on 18,000 acres of land, um, which were all essentially uh, in the east end of the forest. And so some observations, uh, the large virgin timber, this is just really large old growth. Uh, there were 10,000 acres of 250 million board feet. There was small virgin timber, uh, small old growth on 18,000 acres with 90 million board feet. So on roughly half the acreage, the old, the large old growth contained over twice the volume of timber, right? And these are why these trees were so valuable because they, uh, they were, uh, they have just a lot of biomass with them. They're huge, right? They, uh, the amount of timber uh, scales by the square of the radius. Um, the prices are ridiculous. Uh, $2.50 $2 per thousand board feet, inflation adjusted, that's $33 a, board, a thousand board feet, and $1.50 uh, per thousand board feet. Uh, the price of redwood today, uh, $600 per thousand board feet. So uh, talk about something that has far outpaced the price of inflation. So in 1949, California completes the purchase and uh, of the Casper lands and designates it as Jackson Demonstration State Forest uh, to be managed by the Department of Forestry, uh, then CDF, which is now CAL FIRE, on behalf of the people of California for sustainable timber harvest, innovative demonstrations, and science. So uh, 
the history following the 1949 uh, uh, kind of the start of Jackson State Forest is outlined in this forest management plan uh, or the kind of the uh, history of the forest, so to speak. Um, and so when the state acquired the Casper Lumber Company's lands, uh, most of the Casper water, uh, coastal watersheds at that time had regenerated to 15 to 60 year old second growth forests. Um, and so this is all uh, what's marked in Y, uh, cut, uh, cut over land offered with second growth timber, right? So all this land had been cut over, but by the time the state got it, it had uh, largely regenerated. Though uh, I find this uh, pretty remarkable, uh, post fire log, uh, uh, post logging fires had burned through many of the regenerated stands. So uh, it's kind of amazing to think about in the early 1900s, uh, fires uh, kind of burning through what is now coastal Mendocino County. Um, in an, uh, at a time when uh, heavy logging had just occurred. Um, and so, yeah, I, I find that pretty remarkable. So, uh, Casper Lumber Company started this partial cutting on the east end of the forest in the 1930s. Um, after acquiring the forest, the state continued cutting on the east uh, end of the, during the 1950s and 60s. Uh, the first round of harvest was an individual marked tree selection that removed 70% of the coniferous volume. So uh, in the first uh, two decades, 70% of the volume in the east end of the forest was uh, cut down. Um, and this is at that time, all those old growth trees on the uh, nearly 20,000 acres um, that, uh, that the state bought uh, were cut down. Um, and then the initial cut was followed by a diameter limit harvest that removed the remaining coniferous trees greater than 22 inches. So uh, by the late 1960s, uh, all the old growth trees that were here on nearly 20,000 acres uh, had been removed and the forest had at that point uh, trees no larger than 22 inches. And so today there's only 450 acres of old growth left in Jackson. And to kind of further uh, give more uh, insight into what happened, so when the state acquired uh, the land, it was already in a pretty highly productive condition. Again, all those uh, all those uh, second growth stands that cut over land had regenerated nicely. Uh, but for the most part, the forest consisted of uncut or relatively recently cut old growth stands uh, and large tracts of fairly well stocked but immature second growth stands. Um, the first uh, pattern was uh, established, the first management pattern was established by Casper Lumber Company and focused on harvesting the remaining old growth in the east. Um, and this was at the time they removed, the, again, the 70% volume removal, and this kind of mirrored the common practice of getting the timber off the tax rolls, and this was known as the 12 and 3 quarter approach. This actually refers to section 12 and 3 quarter of the California State Constitution, which was uh, known as the ad valorem tax. This tax uh, taxed private landowners um, for the timber that were standing on their property, but that they didn't even cut down. Um, so what this actually ended up doing was incentivizing kind of this uh, liquidation forestry model that uh, private uh, private landowners, uh, as long as they cut down more than 70% of the trees on their land or their stands were less than 40 years old, they were not taxed. So this 12 and three quarter rule uh, really uh, bolstered uh, this, this uh, process of liquidation forestry. Uh, again, the second uh, uh, harvesting approach was the 22-inch uh, diameter limit cut. Uh, again, a lot of the old growth was removed, and it's interesting to note that in 1964, the species preference was for Doug fir and grand fir, and the young growth redwood and bishop pine being acceptable and hemlock being discouraged. Of course, now uh, all the value is in redwood. Um, so. Uh, in the 60s, this is when the Casper cutting trials begin. This is actually related to the first phase of the Casper watershed study. Um, and this was when allowable annual harvest was set equal to growth. Um, and while these, uh, while the young stands were regenerating, it was the old growth that was providing the harvest uh, and the maturation uh, while the young stands matured. 
So uh, essentially, to summarize uh, just a little bit, in the first two or three decades, the management of Jackson, uh, the state cut down nearly all of the old growth that they had got. Um, and this, uh, the effects of this heavy-handed management can still very clearly be seen today, uh, which we will look at here in a little bit. So if we look at the harvest history of Jackson, uh, which goes back to 1960, uh, prior to 2000, the four decades of, of time between 1960 and 2000, the annual average harvest was about 27 uh, uh, million board feet. Um, and then it was in 2000, um, and this is again, uh, 26 million board feet was seen to be about equal to as much as the forest was growing in a year. So this was harvest equal uh, to growth. Uh, and then in 2000, uh, concerned by the large harvest in recent years, uh, you know, getting up to above uh, almost 50 million board feet in one year, uh, the campaign to save Jackson spearheaded by Vince Taylor filed a successful lawsuit against the state and then later another successful lawsuit, which stopped logging in Jackson for close to a decade. And so uh, harvest history post 2000 uh, uh, is pretty remarkable. So from 2000 to 2020, the average harvest uh, in gray here is less than 70% the pre-2000 average. And then after uh, timber harvest uh, started back up at around 2009, 2010, uh, this is now at about uh, on average 15 million board feet uh, per year, um, which is about half of what it uh, was prior to 2000. So this is where um, the uh, the model of cutting half equal to growth kind of began uh, out of this uh, lawsuit here. Um, and so this 70% uh, this decrease in harvest levels pro, uh, post 2000 uh, has had a tremendous uh, impact on the forest. So if we look at the inventory numbers, uh, and this is uh, in orange here is the continuous forest inventory. Uh, these are all numbers from CAL FIRE. Um, you can see that at that time where they were trying to cut uh, a harvest or trying to harvest uh, equal to growth, they were pretty successful. Um, inventory didn't change much. Uh, and then it, uh, it kind of appears here that around 1989, the forest start, uh, began to grow, but we'll, we'll come back to this here in a second. Uh, beginning in uh, 2005, they started another inventory system. This is the forest resource inventory. Um, and this is a more comprehensive inventory system. CFI is longer. Uh, this is more comprehensive. So it is based off of several thousand uh, plots in the forest. And you can see that this, uh, both of the inventory uh, measurements for the FRI are about 30% lower than the CFI. But you can also see that within each one, they're self-consistent, um, which is at least good, right? Um, so we can gain even more insight uh, into what's going on here with the forest by uh, comparing the harvest and the inventory methods. And because inventory is on five-year intervals, we'll go ahead and look at cumulative harvest on five-year intervals. And so everything is pretty consistent, right? Or what you would, what you would expect, right? Uh, harvest goes up, inventory goes down, harvest goes up, inventory goes down, and harvest goes down, inventory goes up, et cetera, et cetera. But here is uh, something fairly strange. Harvest goes up and inventory also goes up. So that is, uh, that's suspicious. Um, there's no inventory published for 1994. Um, I don't think this was ever released. I'm not sure what happened with it. Um, and then uh, in, again, in 2000, you see the dramatic drop um, and then slowly kind of ramping back up. And then it's about this time that you do uh, really see the forest start to put on a lot of biomass. Um, and so from the uh, inventory levels uh, and the harvest levels, we can uh, we can reconstruct growth rates. And what we see when we do that um, is that this period at 1989 uh, has a growth rate of over 5%. Um, that is not realistic. That is not physical. Um, and so it turns out what happened here um, is around this time, uh, CDF had switched to a, uh, an inventory accounting method known as, uh, IFI. It didn't stick around long. This is about the same time when they started using computer modeling, a program called Cryptos. 
Um, and so ultimately, um, this increase right here in inventory is not real. Um, but at least, you know, going on after that, uh, the that the uh, CFI estimates are at least self-consistent. Um, and so we can use these data here uh, if we're going to estimate growth rates over the last 10 years that the current forest growth rate uh, on average is about 2% per year, which is, uh, which is what uh, Cal Fire states as well. Um, and based on some, uh, uh, ba uh, you know, uh, not super sophisticated statistics, um, I come up with a current 22 forest inventory of 2.2 plus or minus 0.3 uh, billion board feet. So as low as 1.9 billion board feet or as high as 2.5 billion board feet. Um, and so uh, we can ask, where is all this growth at over the last two decades, right? So this growth is uh, over the last two decades is uh, almost certainly very, very real. And so where is it all at? And so here's where we can use uh, the ecosystem LIDAR. So this is the JEDI mission. This is the Global Ecosystem Dynamics Investigation, LIDAR, light detection by uh, and ranging. Uh, this was attached to the International Space Station in 2018, which is orbiting at a distance of 254 miles above the Earth's surface. Uh, this instrument shoots lasers down at the surface of the Earth, um, and it covers fairly broad swaths at uh, pretty high resolution um, for being uh, attached to a satellite 254 miles above the Earth. Uh, these lasers come down and they bounce off the canopy uh, and the subcanopy and even the surface of the Earth. Um, and these are reflected back up to the space station and uh, the instrument captures these reflected pulses. And what you can do is you can generate a vertical distribution based on the capture returns of uh, uh, essentially the, the vertical distribution of the structure in the forest, right? And most commonly people use this for estimating biomass. And so what does this look like over uh, the North Coast? Um, so to give you a sense of the data, um, here is the, uh, this is biomass and it's a relative scale. And so darker green equals these high old growth, uh, high biomass forests, right? Old growth redwood, the most biomass, uh, the most uh, highest biomass forests in the world. Light green, second growth conifer forest along the North Coast is going to be mostly redwood forests. Uh, medium, uh, these yellowish uh, are young conifer forests and oak uh, and conifer forests are in orange. And at the lowest biomass end of the system, you have meadow and chaparral with like scattered oak woodlands. So to kind of orient you here, uh, though I'm sure you're probably already fairly familiar with this area, we have Headwaters Reserve up here uh, for this north. Uh, we have Humboldt Redwood State Park. We have Jackson uh, right here in the middle. And down to the very south, we have Point Reyes. Um, and so we can see here that uh, overall, uh, the North Coast is not doing great in terms of forest biomass. Um, and this is, uh, this has been, uh, this is pretty well known, right? This is uh, reflected in uh, the latest State of the Redwoods uh, report by Save the Redwood Leagues that, you know, of old growth forests, there's only 7% remaining. Uh, and these are, again, these dark, dark, dark green areas. Uh, what I didn't know, which I found pretty fascinating, is it's a mature second growth forest. Uh, there's actually even less of these, only 2% remaining. Um, and the reason is, is in the 1980s, when uh, old growth trees were starting to get their protections, uh, these mature second growth, the trees that were growing immediately after the very first harvesting in 1860, uh, these trees did not get any protections. So they continued to be cut. And at present, there's only about 2% left. Uh, with a large majority of them here on Jackson. Uh, the majority of the North Coast is, uh, over 90% of it is these intermediate second growth trees, very dense uh, young forests. Um, again, reflected by the, uh, by the yellows and the, uh, as young conifer forests. So most of the biomass in Jackson, if we zoom in here, uh, is located in the middle and the Southwest portions of the forest. Um, the east end of the forest is in pretty sad shape, uh, very low biomass, and resembles the surrounding private timberlands. Um, 
and we can actually uh, kind of get a more regional manage, uh, perspective of forest management, um, uh, looking at the different land ownerships, right? Jackson here is public land, um, but uh, along the North Coast, right, these are all uh, industrial managed timberlands. So majority landholders are Redwood, Mid uh, Redwood uh, Mendocino Redwood Company, uh, Lime Redwoods and Soper Wheeler are the primary landholders here. Um, and uh, and so these uh, these forests are uh, very, very highly managed. And so we can ask, you know, if there's all this growth here, it's pretty uh, suggestive based on the inventory measurements that this growth happened uh, post 2000. But uh, is there how do we verify that? Um, and fortunately, the satellite area began in uh, the late 70s. And so there is satellite imagery of Jackson from uh, uh, 18 or 1984 onward. Um, and so we can get a, a look of uh, what happened in the forest over these last 20 years. And the time is down here. So uh, in this first period between 18, uh, 1984 and 2000, the forest was pretty heavily managed, but again, still not actually as heavily managed as the surrounding private timberlands. Um, what we can do now is then look at the second period, uh, 2000 to 2020, and uh, compare what happens in Jackson to uh, what's happening in the surrounding private timberlands. So remember, after 2000, there was a lawsuit, uh, there was no cutting allowed, and it's pretty remarkable. You can actually see the forest turn this dense green, um, and it's not until around 2010 that harvesting starts beginning again, but at a much lower rate, um, again, half equal to harvest. Um, so it's pretty remarkable that uh, even with the satellite data uh, at the time, you can see quite literally the forest respond and recover in the absence of timber harvest. Um, so this uh, really nicely uh, corroborates what we see here from the inventory data that the forest actually really responded and grew substantially uh, in the two decades after 2000. So uh, we can take, uh, as time passes, satellite imagery just gets better. Uh, these are uh, from the, uh, from the uh, Worldview Digital Globe. This is a uh, half a meter resolution satellite. Um, and we can take a look at some of these harvest areas that are uh, that follow, uh, that are in these later years. Um, and uh, it's it's really nice. I mean, it's it's interesting that we are really in kind of the golden age of remote sensing that really quite literally anyone can uh, get online and uh, look at this data and see what's going on in the forests around them. Uh, it's pretty remarkable, but we can get even more detailed uh, and we can do this with airborne LIDAR. Um, so airborne LIDAR is identical to the space-based LIDAR, except that it's attached to an airplane. It's at a lot lower uh, elevation. It's much cheaper, right? Because you don't have to launch a, a rocket to space um, and it's higher resolution, right? So what you get um, is you get LIDAR point clouds. So these are digital representations of the analog trees. Um, and so the data uh, that you get from these is very high resolution. This is not from Jackson. This is just an example, but you can see things like power lines, um, cars parked in parking lots, uh, even the structure of buildings. Um, it's pretty remarkable data. Um, and it's also very large data. And so what's showing here is actually the height above ground. Um, and so some background on the LIDAR of GDSF, it was uh, collected all across Mendocino County by the United States Geological Survey in 2017. Uh, so this is publicly accessible, you can download it, uh, but it's also very unwieldy and hard to work with because uh, it's just, it's a big data. Um, so the data here are rendered as a canopy height model. So what you'll be seeing is the uh, just the height of trees uh, elevation has been subtracted. So the elevations of mountains, that digital elevation models have been subtracted out. And so this is what the forest looks like from the state or the airborne LIDAR. Um, you can see that uh, the all the history of past management actually shows up really, really well. Like you cannot see this uh, from satellite because it just all looks green. Uh, but when you look at the distribution of tree heights uh, in this map view, 
you can see uh, all the history of past management. And so just kind of some things to note uh, down here, Van Dam State Park looking pretty good. Uh, lots of big trees, uh, Russian Gulch State Park, uh, lots of big trees, very nice. Um, and also though, if you blur your eyes, uh, there are a lot of big trees in Jackson. There is no doubt about it. Um, but what's interesting here is uh, you can see the, uh, the semblance of a line here uh, separating the west end of the forest from the east end. Um, and this is no coincidence, right? So remember this map from uh, the original sale document? It uh, corresponds exactly, exactly with where we see the large trees and the small trees in Jackson. Um, and so this management in the uh, 50s, 60s, and 70s, where they cut down heavy, very heavy-handed management in the east end of the forest, you can still see the effect of that today. So the trees are still very short there. Um, and uh, it was actually the part of the forest that looks best now is actually in the cutover land, the, you know, quote-unquote cutover land uh, that it was able to regenerate uh, over the years while uh, the old growth trees were getting cut down in the east end of the forest. Uh, so it's pretty remarkable. Uh, we can compare the LIDAR with satellite. So again, uh, there's just a lot more information embedded in the LIDAR. Uh, you can actually see individual tree heights as where when you look at the satellite, uh, you can see the topography, but you can't get a feel for tree heights. Um, we can uh, zoom in and kind of look at the kind of native resolutions um, and it's just uh, it's just pretty remarkable that the LIDAR uh, gives you uh, just really remarkable um, uh, kind of uh, picture of what's happening on the forest floor and what's happening with like individual trees. Uh, it's, it's incredible. Um, so you can see things like uh, the past footprint of very, very old group selection cuts. So when you walk through this area, which I have, um, you cannot tell that you're walking through these old uh, group selections, but you, uh, but from the LIDAR, you can very clearly see the footprint of past management. Uh, this area of the forest is pretty short. It's very dense, very brushy, um, very short trees, but you can't, uh, because you're in it, you can't see that you're walking in and out of these small group, uh, group, sele uh, group uh, selection cuts. Um, more recent group selection where they have, uh, in some areas, uh, removed uh, all the trees, but in other areas, you can see that they have left uh, trees scattered throughout uh, the area. Um, and these are known as seed trees. So the idea here is to leave these trees so they reseed these areas and provide the next uh, generation of trees. Uh, what you can also get a sense here is that uh, as these are streams, uh, the location isn't perfect, but uh, you can see that the trees along the tree uh, streams are much larger, right? These are the watercourse lake and protection zones. Uh, so here's a really nice example where you can see how the trees along the streams are quite large. Um, but outside these watercourse lake and protection zones, they have been uh, 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 harvested pretty intensely. Um, and so these are the, the purpose of these is to uh, reduce stream sedimentation and to give the stream a buffer um, and have larger trees over the stream so it keeps water temperatures down as well. Uh, you can look on private timberlands. So this is outside of Jackson uh, on MRC land. Uh, where I haven't plotted the streams or the roads, and you can see the effect of the watercourse lake and protection zones where um, these are still very present, uh, very large trees along the, uh, along the streams, but heavily managed uh, outside the stream corridors. And you can even see the road beds uh, appearing as these flat uh, corridors through the forest as they wiggle around, um, pretty remarkable. Um, you can see things like cable corridors, right? So when a logging operation happens, uh, you build roads along the ridge tops. These roads drop down to landings. Uh, uh, trees are felled down throughout these areas. Um, and then cable corridors are cut through the forest. Um, and then trees are skidded up to the landing where they are loaded on trucks and then taken to the mill. And so 
uh, it's it's pretty remarkable that these uh, cable corridors show up so well. Um, I think it's generally underappreciated how much these have an effect on the residual forest structure. And these are things that you really can't see very well in the satellite photo. So um, if you look at the high resolution satellite, and this was collected June 16th, 2017, this is the same time the LIDAR was being shot. Uh, it's really hard to see these cable corridors, but they are very, very definitely there. Um, and so it's, I think it's just generally underappreciated uh, because you can't really see them in satellite imagery, how much they alter residual forest structure. And then if you're looking at uh, just Google Earth, um, and this is from 2022, uh, you see uh, that the cable corridors are still present um, and you can get a flavor of them. Uh, but again, unless you're looking for them, uh, they're really hard to see. Um, and you can see here after the LIDAR was shot in 2017, there was a few more uh, group selection cuts here on the backside of the ridge um, that, again, don't show up in the LIDAR because they happened after the LIDAR was shot. Um, you can also see things like residual old growth trees, right? So this is Chamberlain Creek Falls. This is an old one of the, this is the nicest old growth grove in Jackson, and you can see here the trees are very large, upwards of 300 feet. Um, and if, for anyone who hasn't been down there, this is a wonderful uh, grove of redwood trees and a nice little waterfall um, down coming into the grove. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's uh, it's definitely a, a bright spot and a great place to go hiking in Jackson. And so uh, now we can get a much better sense of what the space-based LIDAR was telling us, right? So when we look at the space-based LIDAR, we can see just roughly green and then roughly yellow, uh, but it's hard to really contextualize what that means in terms of residual for or the forest structure. But if we look at this area, which contains both the green and the yellows, um, we can really see what's happening here. Um, on average, there are a much greater relative abundance of large trees in Jackson than there are on the surrounding private timberlands. Uh, the surrounding timberlands are very short, um, and, um, and the relative proportion uh, is of large trees is very, very low uh, compared to Jackson. Um, and so when we look at the North Coast, now we can kind of understand what we're seeing here is we're seeing an, uh, an area all along the North Coast of California that has been heavily managed and converted from uh, what were once the most carbon dense forests in the world to very short uh, stands of uh, young growth redwood. So uh, this, uh, this is, uh, I mean, for me, when kind of putting this story together has been kind of, you know, just a, very remarkable to uh, to understand uh, the forests of the North Coast from this perspective that is just now coming to light, right? These data are very, very new. Um, so I'm going to transition now and talk a little bit about climate change because this is the defining issue of our time and something that we will all face as well as our forests. Um, so if it's not abundantly clear, climate change is here now. Um, this is the annual average temperature uh, over the last two decades compared to the previous 50 years uh, before that. And as you can see, um, the earth is uniformly warm, right? Um, and yes, it's humans. You just cannot uh, get the observed uh, temperature trends without accounting for human forcings, right? If you just look at natural forcings only, you cannot re uh, recover what we've seen happen in the last uh, 50 uh, to 100 years. You just can't. Um, and so this warming is unprecedented geologically, right? So uh, people always say, well, it's been warm before. Yes, that's true, but it's the rate that's more meaningful. So if we compare current warming on an apples to apples basis uh, with previous warmings, right? These post deglaciation cycles, um, there's just no comparison, right? This is natural climate change uh, versus anthropogenic, right? They distinguish each, two, uh, each other uh, quite, uh, quite starkly. 
So if we take a look at just what is natural climate change, um, natural climate warming, we see, you know, roughly, you see about 80 part per million increase in about 8,000 years. That's about 0 .1, 0 0.01 ppm per year. This is a natural rate of planetary warming. Um, if you look at uh, global climate, anthropogenic climate change, you see 120 parts per million in about 200 years. This rate is about 0.6 ppm per year. Um, so anthropogenic climate change is happening 60 times the natural rate. And so to put this in perspective, an analogy here, uh, the average car accelerates from zero to 60 in about six seconds. Uh, the g-force that you experience during that acceleration, according to Newton's law, is about 0.5 g's. So when you accelerate from zero to 60, that force that you feel of like sitting back in your chair, that's g-force, right? That's Newton's law. That force is about 0.5 g's. Uh, and if, uh, if we're going to say anthropogenic, uh, anthropogenic climate change, then in that case, if we're calling natural climate change accelerating from zero to 60, uh, anthropogenic climate change would be the ex uh, equivalent of experiencing around 30 G forces. In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this analogy, uh, 30 G forces you could get by accelerating from zero to 4,000 miles an hour in six seconds. Uh, so that's over Mach five. Um, that would give you 30 Gs. That would uh, that would that's what you would experience. Uh, or uh, you could accelerate from zero to 60 in one tenth of a second. Uh, that's literally a blink of an eye. It the average eye blink is actually three tenths of a second. Um, so uh, talk about a neck snapper, right? Uh, climate change is happening extremely fast. I hope this analogy kind of contextualizes how fast and how extreme things are changing. Uh, so if we look at California um, and uh, the historical baseline, um, uh, we see, you know, again, California is an extremely diverse climate. Uh, if we compare that to the end of century emissions, uh, obviously things warm dramatically. Um, and the change from the historical baseline is, uh, is pretty stark, right? And this is under the RCP 8.5 forcings. Um, and what we see for uh, Mendocino County, the Jackson area, is a warming of about uh, seven degrees Fahrenheit. So, you know, uh, areas, uh, or like this last summer when we saw Ukiah hit 117, um, you know, imagine uh, hitting uh, 120 or even 130, right? Uh, this is what RCP 8.5 uh, has in store for us. Uh, if we go down that path, we don't have to. Um, precipitation wise, uh, the changes are much more modest. Um, uh, this uh, ensemble, this is a multi-model ensemble, so this is an average of 10 different climate models, uh, predicts a, a wetting for uh, Northern California. And so I want to be uh, clear here that uh, this is change in mean precipitation, um, and hydroclimate change is extremely complicated, far more complicated than temperature change. Uh, what this is actually hiding is that uh, what we will see, what is actually very robustly predicted, is a uh, an increase in variability. So the normal becomes less normal, and you get more floods and more droughts. So this is a situation in the future where the mean precipitation hasn't changed much. You know, maybe the distribution shifts over a little bit, but what that averaging is hiding is much greater change to the hydrologic cycle. Um, so you're seeing. Uh, a greater proportion of both floods and droughts that are wrapped up and uh, combine or average together to uh, show maybe very little change in the mean. So this uh, is uh, something that, to be aware of. Uh, what is also hidden in this is uh, a greater increase in intraseasonal sharpness, right? So uh, instead of rain coming over maybe say a six month or five month period, what we'll see or what it looks like we'll be seeing is rain coming in much shorter bursts, right? So um, these are uh, relative to uh, pre-industrial control simulations and the lines represent latitude. So if you're looking at 30 degree, 39 degrees, which is about where Jackson is, uh, this is this light green line. What this shows is that relative to uh, uh, unhuman uh, forced uh, climate, in November, we'll be seeing 10% or so less rain, um, but in 
uh, January, we'll be seeing upwards of maybe 20% more rain than we would otherwise. So the, what we're seeing is a contraction of the wet season. So you have a longer dry season, a sharper wet season, but you have more rain coming in a smaller amount of time. Um, and this has practical implications for uh, flooding um, and erosion, um, especially if you don't have heavily treed areas to break the kinetic energy of rainfall as it falls to the ground. Um, and so, uh, so even though you might see like in the image back here where it doesn't look like there's maybe many changes to the hydrologic cycle, the hydrologic cycle is actually changing very dramatically and in very stressful ways, right? We saw, uh, in 2017, the Oroville Dam almost give way, right? Uh, that kind of thing is very likely to become more common. So with regard to forests, um, uh, climate change is not friendly to forests, right? And so this paper recently published in 2021, uh, Climate Driven Limits to Future Carbon Storage in California's Wildland Ecosystems, uh, looks at uh, how our forests in California store carbon in a future warmer climate. Um, and just to note that these changes that we're going to be seeing are from temperature and precipitation alone, right? They do not, uh, this study does not account for fire, timber harvest, changes to fog, precipitation variability, or changes to runoff or anything like that. Um, so what we see is uh, well, just to kind of overall describe the picture along the uh, along the top row, we have RCP 4.5. This is the more moderate climate change scenario. Along the bottom row, we have RCP 8.5, a more severe uh, climate change scenario. And in the uh, far uh, left column, we have the dry change, right, where we have uh, a, a warm temperature climate change, but we uh, are in a drier climate. And then on the right hand side, we have uh, models or simulations that where they simulate warm but wetter climates. Um, and then in the middle column, we have the uh, mean, what we expect uh, to have happen. Um, and so regardless of whether you're in the R RCP 4.5 scenario or the RCP 8.5 scenario, uh, forests in California store less carbon, right? Um, and they do this uh, through two primary means. Uh, forests get shorter uh, as they convert uh, to more uh, drought tolerant species and species that are capable of living in warmer climates. Um, and yeah, and then yeah, also species change as well. And you see, like, for example, in the RCP 8.5 mean change, you see a lot of forest loss along uh, uh, a lot of carbon loss uh, more accurately along the Mendocino coast and the uh, the Santa Cruz Mountains. Um, and so this is, again, based off of models. This is the CMIP-5 uh, uh, class of models, right? So there's uh, this very new model simulations, not the newest, but very new. Um, and so you can also, this study also does another example where um, they use climate analog pairs. Um, and so either way, whether you're looking at RCP uh, uh, simulations or, or uh, model-based CMIP-5 simulations or this climate analog uh, methodology, uh, carbon in uh, uh, California forests is uh, relatively unsafe uh, in a future warmer climate. Um, and a lot of this, again, comes down to species change, right? So conifers uh, suffer disproportionately in a future warmer climate. Um, so uh, uh, above ground carbon storage for conifers uh, decreases by 30% while we see increasing hardwoods, right? So uh, oaks increase pretty dramatically, right, by 43%. And this is because they do better in warmer climates. They have more physiological adaptations to withstand warmer, drier conditions. Uh, conifers don't, right? The only way places you really see conifers succeed in a future warmer climate is at the very highest altitudes where there are currently not trees now. Um, and at the very, very far north coast where there is enough rain and the climate is still moderate enough that it provides a little bit of insulation. Um, so uh, if we look at the present day climate and the distribution of different forest types, uh, Jackson is about here, right? We uh, The average temperature is about 11 degrees C and we get about 1100 uh, 
millimeters of precipitation a year. And so it puts us kind of right on the edge of this temperate forest, though this diagram does not account for um, you know, the uh, fog and the coolness of the ocean. So uh, we're probably solidly up in here. Um, but you know, we're on this edge, right? And so just over the hill in Willits, right, we see more of this grassland savanna type. So we are uh, definitely on this edge of this temperate uh, forest. Um, in a future climate, uh, the biomes shift, right? Um, so what we see is temperature increase dramatically. And then again, uh, this is what we were showing is uh, mean precipitation might increase a little bit, but ultimately it pushes us more into this, uh, into this climate where uh, it's hotter and that favors oaks and shrubs more. Um, and this is the spatial representation of that uh, change where uh, we can look at uh, generally, and this is again, climate analog pairs where uh, in present day climate, uh, things shift north uh, generally uh, in a future climate. Um, so the drier climates, the more water limited, uh, hotter climates of the south transition northward. Um, and the uh, and kind of the change that we saw in Mendocino County is because these are very novel climates. Um, and, and actually the most novel climates are down in the uh, Southern California deserts where, because these are already on the very extreme of the temperature distribution, right? These are areas that uh, are just now starting to hit 130 degrees during the summer. Uh, by 2100, these are areas that are hitting maybe 140, right? And so they have no analog pairs, hence they're the most novel in a future climate. Um, and so a lot of these areas along the coast uh, are going to be very novel uh, climates and, uh, and will favor different species of trees. Um, and so uh, that kind of, I'm just going to try to check the time. I'm at an hour right now. Um, I figured I was going to go a little bit long. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I uh, do have a section on merlets uh, because this climate change and uh, changing forests all come together uh, for merlets. So these are seabirds that are native to the Pacific coast of Northern America. Um, they were first described in 1789, but its nesting locations remained undiscovered until uh, 1974. I think that's pretty remarkable. Uh, it was in the 1950s and 60s that loggers found adults and young eggs uh, in fellow trees in British Columbia, prompting scientists to begin looking for them in forests. Uh, Marble Girlettes nest in mature and old growth forests as far as 60 miles inland. Um, they need branches at least four inches in diameter to lay their one egg per year in. And so you can see this is a nice uh, big branch, well-developed. It's actually got its own ecosystem of mosses, and the egg is laid right in this uh, little depression here in the branch, um, obviously very high off the ground. Um, the complex crowns of mature and old trees provide protection for corvids, which are their primary predators. Uh, their life cycle and survival depends critically on two things. Uh, prey abundant in the oceans for feeding. Uh, they feed mostly off krill, herring, and anchovies and other species of that nature. Um, and mature old forests for breeding. Uh, so if you look at for, uh, ocean conditions, uh, this is the annual anomaly for 1900 um, versus what it is now. Oceans have warmed dramatically, right? You can actually see the footprint of the three-year La Nina that we are currently experiencing. Um, and then also we have lots of mature forest loss over the last hundred years. Um, so between warming oceans and uh, for uh, loss of habitat, uh, marble murelets, uh, much like Native Americans in the 1850s, are kind of in between a rock and a hard spot. And indeed, uh, this paper from 2020 uh, squeezed by habitat split, warming ocean conditions and loss of uh, habitat uh, reduce long-term occupancy. Um, and so this study finds that with warming ocean conditions, so negative means deteriorating ocean conditions, so warmer oceans increases the probability of vacancy for murelet nests. Um, the decreasing proportion of mature forest also pretty sharply increases the probability of vacancy in nests, um, as well as distance to the coast. So the further out uh, from the ocean you get, the probability of vacancy increases. 
Um, and so when we look at what we have in store for the future, uh, projected marine heat waves and the potential for each eco ecological impacts, uh, it's not looking good for murelets. Um, if we compare the uh, maximum intensity of historical marine heat waves uh, to what we expect by mid-century 2060, uh, marine heat waves are increased by uh, two to four degrees uh, over their historical intensity. But what's even more remarkable is the number of heat wave days per year. So in the historical period, you get about uh, any, up in the 30s maximum of marine heat wave days. By mid-century under RCP 8.5 forcing, you're up to 300 days of marine heat waves. Um, and so uh, this is kind of indicated here that uh, the duration of marine heat waves increases pretty dramatically, uh, but the frequency decreases. What this is telling us is that um, you have essentially by the end of 2100, you have a state of constant marine heat wave, right? The oceans are just perennially warm. Um, and so even the heat waves that we've seen uh, at present, uh, the 2019 to 21 heat wave, which is kind of colloquially known as blob number two, and the evolution of the 2014-2015 heat wave, uh, blob number one, uh, these heat waves are very clearly uh, linked to rising levels of greenhouse gases. Um, and so if we look at what we expect for the future from the newest generation of climate models, um, we see a pretty dramatic increase in the multiplication factor for marine heat waves. If we look at the past, we see that there's this sharp jump, and actually it's fairly concerning that the observed past is actually sitting on the edge of the range of modeled variability, which uh, begs the question, are we actually underestimating ocean warming? Um, and, and so ultimately, right, this bodes not well for marine ecosystems. I mean, ultimately, right, uh, if you have 300 days of, you know, anomalies of uh, four and five degrees, I mean, that kind of is going to spell the collapse of marine ecosystems. We're already seeing kelp forest collapse um, and species change, uh, abalone, urchins, starfish, etc. So coupled with uh, future forest loss, right, shorter forests, more oaks, right, which aren't suitable to nesting, um, and marine heat waves, um, the future is not looking good. But that said, uh, JDFS offers a glimmer of hope, right? This is an area that has a lot of big trees that are very suitable for nesting murelets. Um, the proportion of mature forest is very high, relatively speaking. Uh, so this decreases the probability of vacancy for nests, and it is close to the coast, um, which also, uh, would bode well. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, it, it's, 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 it, Jackson offers uh, potentially uh, a, a refuge for murelets in the future when there is not many places along the North Coast that are refuges for them. So uh, to conclude, just a few take home points here. Uh, JDF, JDSF is a remarkable forest, like it truly is. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about it. Uh, there quite literally is no place along the entire North Coast like it. Um, however, at the same time, JDSF is currently managed for maximum sustained timber production. So we need to ask ourselves, does that management objective reflect the climate, environmental, and biodiversity, social, and cultural imperatives of our time? Um, and at a time when we only have 2% of mature second growth left, and a lot of that is actually on Jackson, does uh, continuing to manage for sustain, maximum sustained timber production make sense? And there's no objective answer to that. That is a value judgment um, that we as individuals need to make. Uh, the climate is changing at a truly next stepping rate. There's no getting out of that. There's no getting around it. Uh, and our forests are literally changing before our eyes as well, right? And it's pretty well accepted that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction. Uh, extinction rates are 15 times above the historical background rate. Populations of vertebrae have uh, declined by over 68% in the last five decades, and 40% of plants alone are considered uh, endangered. 
And it's becoming increasingly recognized that we as people and as scientists are actually underestimating the challenges of avoiding a ghastly future. Um, and so this is something that we need to be thinking more seriously about as we move forward. Um, globally, I mean, we really are teetering on the edge of these irreversible tipping points, right? So uh, this paper published in 2016, we're looking at tipping points that are potentially triggered in the par within the Paris climate range and things like the West Antarctic ice sheet in Greenland and Alpine glaciers, things that we're already seeing uh, undergo massive changes today um, are already happening, right? And so we're already in this realm of, of of potentially triggering irreversible tipping points. Um, and so changing how we manage our forests here in California is not going to solve our climate, environmental, or biodiversity woes. Like, it just won't. Uh, but it will help, right? So this is truly a case uh, where we need to be uh, thinking uh, global but acting local, right? Um, there's this because it's a huge problem, uh, and it's hard to it's hard to wrap our minds around. around. And you know, there's this old uh, Buddhist saying that uh, you know this monk goes to a monastery, uh, and his first task is to sweep. And this uh, monastery has this huge, uh, huge courtyard, and he asks this other monk, "Am I supposed to sweep all of this?" And the uh, the monk looks at him and says, "No, uh, only sweep what's in front of you." And this is kind of what we how we have to be thinking is it's a huge problem, but we need to be acting in how and where we can, uh, both as uh, individuals and as a state. Um, so there's no doubt about it. Uh, JDSF offers a glimmer of hope for the future of North Coast forest, right? If there can be, uh, the forest can restore and rebound in Jackson, they can elsewhere. Uh, so if the state truly wants Jackson to be a demonstration forest, we need to see forest practice regulations change such that private timberlands are set at minimum on the trajectory that Jackson has been on for the past two decades. Um, in that scenario, you could see uh, forests regenerate all along the North Coast, right? And so that uh, is a reason for hope that our forests could actually come back, um, albeit there will be a lot of disturbance. Um, and at, accordingly, looking forward, Jackson's management should increasingly prepare for mitigating a future uh, of climate-induced disturbances, right? So um, uh, this uh, climate change and forest disturbances um, essentially are going hand in hand, both fire, insects, uh, floods, erosion, you name it, species change, right? And so this paper concludes that both ecosystems and society need to be prepared for an increasingly disturbed future for forests, right? And so to get ahead of that, we need to start managing for that now. Um, so management really should seek to balance mitigating wildfire risks while also minimizing near emissions as much as possible. Anytime you manage a forest, you're always kind of that. But really, it's about balancing uh, the risk of wildfire with the emissions from harvest, right? And this paper was really nice. It puts these... Uh, it puts these different emission types in context, right? And they conclude that on public lands, management aimed at less intensive fuels reduction, such as removal of ladder fuels, shrubs, and small diameter trees will help balance reducing catastrophic wildfire while leaving live mature leaves on the landscape to continue carbon uptake, right? And this is what I would call uh, climate smart forest management as we move forward into, a, into this future that is highly uncertain um, in terms of uh, various uh, environmental variables. But one thing we know is that it's going to be hot and very likely large changes to the water cycle, which will alter species distributions. Um, and so climate smart forest management is also biodiversity smart forest management. Um, when we're thinking about how we can mitigate uh, different action or use different actions for climate mitigations to co-benefit biodiversity, right? Protecting biodiverse and carbon-rich natural environments and ecological restoration of potentially biodiverse uh, and carbon-rich habitats uh, and the deliberate creation of novel habitats taking into consideration the locally adapted and meaningful mix of these measures can result in the most robust win-win solutions uh, for climate and biodiversity. Um, and so uh, the need to foster more resilient forests to benefit uh, biodiversity really does not stop at the borders of public lands, right? Uh, you could restore Jackson to 
old growth conditions. Uh, but if the rest of the forest looks as it does, uh, that's not going to help uh, murrelets or other endangered species much. Um, and this is where uh, really ownership patterns uh, and conservation really overlap. And you know, this study concludes that cross-boundary ecosystem management is crucial for the effective conservation of present mixed-day ownership landscapes. Integrative forest management that considers biodiversity and social ecological aspects across ownerships is indispensable. Um, and so this moving forward, this is the kind of whole kind of holistic integrative approach to forest management that we really need and that the uh, climate of our times really, uh, really requires. So uh, with that, you know, I'm sorry for going over. I knew I had a lot of slides and there's a lot to talk about, but hopefully uh, this was enlightening. And if you have any questions about this presentation, email me or I will stay on uh, as long as the hosts will stay on to answer questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. A lot there to chew on. <laughs> so let's see, do we have any questions? There were some observations, I think, on the chat. Um, and uh, if we go I don't know whether to start with the most recent stuff and work backward or the other way around. Uh, we had a little back and forth about marble merlets, and uh, my question was uh, whether any of them are currently known to nest there. And uh, I did get an answer in the chat uh, that the surveys have not found any marble merlets uh, in 2022, and apparently it's been many years since anyone has found active nesting sites in Jackson. So the Merlet habitat is basically a potential habitat, but as far as anyone knows, there are no Merlets currently using it, uh, which is consistent with what I had understood from various conversations over the years that uh, in Mendocino County, I think the only ones that anybody knows for sure are down almost at the south, south end of the county. Yeah, that was uh, my understanding as well. Um, but it does offer hope for future habitat. And apparently, uh, in kind of researching this, marble murrelets like to nest where they hear other marble murrelets. So it offers a potential for uh, calling some in, right? Um, if they can uh, utilize some of these nesting spots, maybe they can make a rebound in Jackson. Uh, there's certainly a lot of potential. Yeah, I guess my my question after that would be, where are they going to come from? <laughs> There's a lot of marble merlets, but they're all in Alaska. And <laughs> the, the California population is so small now. I'm not sure how you'd get any to, to fly over the forest if they're all going to Alaska to breed. I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know either. I'm sure there's biologists that have answers to that, though. Um, and, you know... Uh, it certainly could be an area for future research for Jackson, how to actually get murrelets back into the forest. Yeah, yeah. Reestablishing murrelets is a lot. Of, that's a recurring theme, right? There's some discussion about reestablishing otters and things like that. So it's a, a question that's beginning to get a lot of attention is uh, how do you do that? Even if you can reestablish habitat, and, you know, the next problem is how do you get the top level uh, users of that habitat to reestablish. Not simple stuff. Uh, let's see, there was a question way back at, uh, early on, and this was, I thought, a good question. Uh, you were talking about the history of Jackson and, and the uh, Casper Lumber Company sale to the state. And then the question was, how did the Casper Lumber Company get the claim on the land in the first place? Uh, I don't think anyone knows, uh, honestly. Um, I mean, <laughs> this was... Uh, Maybe someone knows. I don't. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, uh, 1860. This is a time of uh, homesteaders, right? And people just kind of laying claim to land. Uh, they're um, uh, based on the reading that I've done and my understanding uh, there. There was in 18 prior to 1849, there was only about 12 to 15,000 uh, non-native people in California, right? It was very sparsely populated. 
Um, and so the people that were coming over, um, I mean, yeah, there just wasn't governance. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, and I'm not sure anyone does, um, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. The question was, you know, did they just occupy it and start logging it? And it's entirely possible. I mean, it, it is, it, yeah, it is entirely possible for sure. There's been some uh, historical research on, you know, the village of Mendocino, for example, and ab initio, the first European guys to come up here from the San Francisco Bay Area, just basically camped out on the land and said, "Okay, this is mine now." <laughs> Right. Yeah. So that was where the first claims came from. Uh, someone else observed uh, you were talking about the uh, remarkable uh, note about fire having had a big effect on the the landscape in the what became Jackson State Forest uh, in the early years after the first round of cutting, and somebody observed that in, at least in a lot of the coast areas there was deliberate burning of former forest land in an attempt to create grassland, uh, open land to graze livestock. And I don't know if that was done deliberately in Jackson or, uh, or if it just was natural wildfire. Well, uh, yeah, so uh, my understanding, and I'm sure, again, this is, you know, in the early uh, early 1900s and maybe late 1800s, um, so there's not great documentation, uh, certainly, uh, that there was a lot of fire that was deliberately set. Um, uh, and a lot of that was actually set to clear paths for removing trees, right? So these were broadcast burns um, that, you know, helped clear the forest, you know, for, to get out the big trees. Um, it would not surprise me at all uh, if there was burning to create uh, rangeland as well. Um, that was a pretty common practice uh, in certainly other areas. So there's no reason to believe that there weren't some people here doing it as well uh, then. And then the next observation somebody made uh, when you were doing the graphs of the uh, inventory, which uh, was pretty fascinating stuff, uh, kind of pointed out that the inventory numbers basically represent uh, sequestered carbon. Uh, that's right. Yeah. Um, so uh, the inventory numbers are measured in, uh, uh, these ones specifically are measured in thousand board feet per acre. Um, and a board foot is actually a measurement of volume. Um, and so uh, in that volume of wood, um, that is biomass, right? Uh, uh, redwood is, or most wood kind of rule of thumb is about 50% uh, by weight carbon. Um, and so uh, that, yeah, that absolutely, that increase in board feet or volume of timber on the land represents uh, sequestered carbon. Um, and uh, redwoods do a remarkably good job at it. Um, and not to mention as they get older and their bark thickens uh, and a greater proportion goes into heartwood, which is very decay resistant, uh, it's that uh, it's that decay resistance in the thick bark that insulates it from fire uh, that allows it to actually represent long term uh, sequester or storage uh, that's you know meaningful on climate relevant timescales. Right, right. Once it's locked away in the in the heartwood of an old redwood tree, it's very hard to release that carbon back to the atmosphere. Absolutely. I mean, unless you unless you send it to a mill, right, where it's processed and, <laughs> yeah. and whatnot. In, in that case, right, you can uh, unlock that carbon, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, ultimately, some amount is in, ends up ending uh, ends up in a uh, in the long uh, hard uh, the uh, the wood storage pool um, uh, of you know kind of long term. Uh, uh, wood products, you know, decks and fences and whatnot, you know, um, around uh, 70 to 90 percent of the redwood that's logged on the north coast uh, ends up as decking material. Um, and so uh, then you ask yourself, then you got to ask yourself, well, how long does the average deck last? Yeah. Um, and is that is that meaningful on climate relevant time scales? Right. Decks don't last as long as redwood trees do. They do not. So is that, uh, before I get to the next question that someone else had, uh, 
while we're on that topic, is that a topic of um, consideration for the management of Jackson State Forest? Is there consideration being given in, in management circles to managing the forest for carbon sequestration? Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's it's more, um, this is more recent um, where they're really uh, focusing on that, um, but uh, definitely uh, as far as I know, um, this is something that's becoming uh, more increasingly prioritized or um, is being discussed uh, as being more increasingly prioritized, right? So um, maybe, you know, in the future, management moves away from uh, an objective of maximum sustained timber production to something like, you know, maximum sustained carbon sequestration or storage or something like that, you know, who knows, but um, these are things that are being discussed and being considered. Good. That's, that's positive. So uh, there's a great question here. If climate change will favor the growth of oaks, uh, how about the 10 oaks? Because they're more like beech trees. How will they fare? Uh, tan oaks will probably fare pretty fairly well. Um, they're actually uh, that paper. Uh, if you look in the supplemental material, uh, there actually is um, there is a species breakdown in the supplemental material, and tan oaks are included. If I recall off the top of my head, uh, tan oaks uh, increased by uh, around three percent. So it wasn't a large increase, but um, tan oaks are, are pretty drought resistant, uh, drought resistant, you know, they, they fare, uh, fairly well, uh, in warm climates, but not terribly warm, right? The only place you find tan oaks is, you know, essentially on this side of, you know, uh, the divide. Um, and there's actually a nice population of tan oaks, uh, in Plumas County and in these, uh, Western slopes of the Sierra. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, I don't have uh, a, a great answer for that, but um, they will probably do better than conifers. Uh, I think that much is safe to say. Well, they're pretty valuable uh, biologically, so that's good news too. Yeah, they're tremendously valuable biologically. So someone asks, uh, says, you touched on this, can you elaborate on how the native peoples conducted thoughtful controlled fires through the coastal redwoods and what we have to learn from those practices for increasingly fire prone climate change futures? Yeah, um, it's, it's very well known that native peoples in California uh, manage the forest. Um, they uh, lit fires and it's, almost certain that, you know, even before Native peoples, um, uh, I mean, well, we know this uh, uh, very well, right? Fires and forests go together, right? Uh, forests are, um, gymnosperm forests are, you know, 400 million years old, and that's when the forest fires started, right? So <laughs> fires, fires and forests uh, have co-evolved since the dawn of time, right? Um, and humans, uh, indigenous peoples, um, uh, as they lived with these forests, recognized that, um, and in places they lit these fires uh, regularly to um, to increase um, uh, either uh, food production out of uh, various plant species or uh, to clear out the underbrush to make um, hunting easier. Um, and so uh, they came to a forest uh, to an area that was already. Uh, fire adapted, right? Um, and uh, and they continued with this burning practice. So these fires that, and in Jackson, the historic fire return interval is 10 to 20 years, right? It's very short. Jackson really hasn't seen any fire in the last hundred years. Um, and so, um, so these uh, regular burns that native peoples were doing uh, really helped uh, clear out the understory. And uh, because they were regular, uh, you didn't necessarily get these giant conflagrations that um, that that we're seeing today, right? So, um, you, you know, when native peoples were burning regularly uh, for the benefit of the forest, right? Um, these weren't stand replacing fires; these were low intensity fires, uh, and probably also mixed severity fires. So there was probably some places where, almost certainly, 
uh, where fires moved into the trees and killed some of them. Um, that's almost certain. Uh, but by and large, these were low intensity fires because they happened at such regular interval. Um, and that kind of fire is uh, drastically missing from our landscape. Um, and so this should be, um, I guess I didn't uh, talk much about it, but this should be uh, in my for Jackson and really for all forests in California is to get uh, beneficial fire on the landscape as soon as possible um, because uh, prescribed burning, cultural burning uh, really does um, uh, benefit the forest by removing a, a lot of understory ladder fuels and surface fuels that can end up uh, generating uh, crown fires that kill forests. Um, so yeah, it should absolutely be, uh, essentially management should be geared towards getting fire on the land as soon as possible. Safe fire, good fire, low intensity fire. Yeah, uh, that's the problem. It's difficult to do safe, low intensity fire now. It, you know, when, when you stop doing it, the conditions change and it's been long enough without fire that now how do you restart that process safely because the the recent history of uh, managed fire hasn't really been all that good there have been some spectacularly bad outcomes from attempts to reintroduce fire in a few places so yeah. it's an extreme challenge for the for the managers to for, figure for out sure. how to do that for sure, yeah, and those those uh, incidences you're talking about are uh, up in the Sierra, and it's much much harder up in the Sierra because it's just so much drier of a forest. Um, but you yeah, know, exactly. here, here along the coast, um, we do benefit from very moderate weather, um, and so uh, this is why like we should really take advantage uh, of where we are and you know where yep. we're at now and where we are heading to get fire on the ground as soon as possible um, so we don't end up in a situation in 20 years where we're like the Sierra. Yeah, that is, and yeah. that's a point that I think is lost on, on a lot of the fire, wildfire discussion is the, the, the extreme difference between this strip right along the coast uh, that just does not behave in the same way firewise as anywhere else in California, really. Uh, yeah. Because it's cooler and more humid and it just doesn't burn the same way. It can burn, but it doesn't burn the same way. Right, right. Um, but the climate is non stationary and that might not always be true. Hence, why we need to move while we can. Um, yeah, exactly. The longer we wait, the longer we wait, the harder it's going to get. Just so. So here's another. Uh, Detailed question from Shannon. Um, uh, he's read that the climate was drier in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and then there was a wetter period from the 40, 1940s to 1980s. So as a result, there was higher, larger and higher intensity wildfires on either side of the wet period. In other words, pre-1940s and, and more recently. Is that correct? And if so, were the last large scale fires on the coast during that early 20th century dry period? Um, it, it could be right. So there's not um, there's not great uh, information for um, for fire outlines. Um, for example, yeah. in, in the early uh, uh, in the early uh, 1900s. Um, but you know, for the most, I did try to anticipate uh, as many questions as possible. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and good luck so, with that. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is essentially the fire history of of Jackson, right? Um, this is uh, Brown and Baxter, um, and this is the fire history of the California coast, uh, Redwood Forest, and the Mendocino Coast. And this was all conducted in Jackson, um, and this is where uh, they uh, they uh, found that the average fire return interval, uh, and again, this is prior to uh the the 20th century was around uh you know 10 to 20 years um and i didn't you know i flipped a few uh images uh, out from that paper but there was actually another one in there uh which i suggest uh to answer this question um look up this paper uh because i believe it's figure number uh two or something of that nature uh where they actually show you um the uh, the dates of the fire scars uh, in Jackson. Um, and so you probably, uh, I don't remember off the top of my head exactly uh, 
this period that you're talking about. Um, but there probably is some uh, some information in there in this paper that will uh, help answer that question. Cool, perfect, perfect answer to send somebody off to do do the research and give them the paper to look up. Yeah, great. So let's see. The final question I see on here. Uh, let's see. First of all, I'll answer one that I can answer myself. Uh, Someone asked, will this talk be posted on the website? There's a lot of information in it, and it would be nice to review it again. Uh, that is definitely true. And the answer is yes. Uh, we have the Mendocino Coast Audubon Society has a YouTube channel. Uh, I believe it is Mendocino Audubon. Uh, so if you go to YouTube and look us up, you will find our channel, and we will have the video from this presentation, uh, I'm not sure how long it will take us to get it up there. It usually takes a few days before we can uh, get the files and get them clipped and put up there. But we will have this talk on our YouTube channel. So that might help a little bit. And then finally, I have a question here. The focus of this talk was California and JDSF, but what are your comments on coastal redwoods in Oregon and Washington? given all the research you've done on this topic? Um, so to my knowledge, uh, there's only coastal redwoods, uh, Sequoia Semper Venus in Southern Oregon, Southern Coastal Oregon. I don't believe that there's any in Washington. I may be wrong on that. Washington is kind of more famous for the Western red cedar, uh, which get very big and very old too. Uh, not quite as big and not quite as old as uh, coast redwoods. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the one area, right, of if we go back to, um, uh, I believe it was this figure right here, kind of the one area that you do see, well, actually, I can go here to the conifers, right, the one area where you do see growth, uh, you know, some in enhanced carbon storage is right up here in far northern California. Um, and again, this has to do with uh, the amount of rain uh, that they get in this specific area. And so likely for the coast redwoods that are in southern Oregon, which would be up in this area, you would probably see, uh, expect to see an increase uh, in carbon storage in those redwoods as well, um, as they can, you know, again, they're, they're still in what would be considered uh, a climatologically favorable envelope, uh, just specifically in this area. Um, again, due to the amount of rain, if you look at uh, rainfall maps, right, this area gets a tremendous amount of rain. Um, and so, yeah, the redwoods in Southern Oregon will probably fare pretty well, um, I would I would presume. Yeah, much wetter up there, yeah, than Del Norte County and what's the, I can't remember the name, county in Oregon just over the line, but there, uh, even in the climate change models, I think they stay pretty wet. In fact, in some models, they probably get more rain because the higher energy in the in the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, yeah, certainly could be the case. Um, hydrologic change is exceedingly complicated, far more <laughs> complicated and hard than uh, uh, thermodynamic change. Yeah, exactly. I see no more questions. That was a pretty good Q&A session. We had some good, thoughtful and detailed questions. So thanks very cool. much, Dr. O'Brien. That was uh, that was a chewy talk. <laughs> a well, lot good, yeah. Talk. Thank you. I wanted to be as comprehensive as possible. And yes, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please email me. There were a couple of people who were talking about showing a video. Uh, the problem is I have, I think, I don't think I have ever yet seen a video actually work properly on YouTube or on um, on Zoom. Uh, the connectivity just isn't reliable enough. I, I had a few dropouts during the talk, so I'm not sure if it's my end or your end, but I doubt a video will actually work. They, they just never do. But you got a whole bunch of comments in the uh, chat uh, from people who are grateful about this presentation and uh, thank you for it. And I think we'll probably get quite a few people going back to it once we have it up on our YouTube channel.
All right, cool. I'm just, I'm just scrolling through the comments, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, very good. And thanks everyone, uh, especially those of you with the thoughtful questions. That, that always is nice. We have a good discussion at the end. Uh, as I said earlier, we will be back with another program uh, next month. So I hope you will join us for that one as well. And maybe we'll see you out in the woods. Thanks again, Dr. O'Brien. Thank you. That, we will wrap things up for tonight.